Hey guys, uh, welcome again uh, for this uh, second session of worship ministry. Uh, let me share my screen again and we'll get started. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so um, we see how uh, the, uh, the Jesus music from Jesus uh, movement from the 60s and 70s was fully developed by 1980. Okay, we are in the notes, page 29. Uh, again, all of these are also just a few, some of the artists uh, who are very influential in that era. Okay, and in the 1990s, uh, we, uh, we started seeing the Hillsong movement coming in, the Integrity and Hosanna music, um, which was led by Ron Kenoli and Don Moen, which kind of peaked. Uh, you know, there was a lot of uh, albums after albums being released. Um, and it was also in the 90s where you might have heard of this movement called the Vineyard. Uh, music, okay, which was from the UK, the England and the Britain side, okay, vineyard music uh, was also getting popular, uh, you know, so, uh, and so basically the music from the West was, uh, uh, during this time, was only divided into two, uh, two sections or two categories, not sections, sorry. Uh, one was the Afro-American gospel music, Okay, which uh, which later got to know as the urban contemporary contemporary gospel, which was very famous in uh, in the Afro American churches, um, the, you know, uh, as they call it, um, you know, the gospel music in today's uh, in today's language they call it, they they call their kind of music as the gospel music, uh, which is predominantly played in their churches, while on the other hand, in the other mainline churches uh, in Southern Baptists, uh, you know, you have artists like Bill Gaither, you know, which is more country uh, kind, uh, country style and whatnot, which became more famous. So there were just two main categories that kind of popularized in the 90s and evolved. Okay. And then in from 2000 till present, once again, I've just mentioned just a handful of, uh, you know, musicians, uh, artists, uh, whom we still listen to right now, right? Like Casting Crowns, Chris Tomlin, Paul Belosh, uh, Michael W. Smith, Hillsong, Jesus Culture, Elevation Worship, just to name a few, right? Um, so, um, okay, I, I want I want to play as a video again, uh, you know, of um, a practical demonstration of all these different styles that was influenced by Jesus movement and the Jesus music from the 70s and the 80s and 90s. OK, um, so just bear with me. This is uh, again, like I'm saying, it's for more practical uh, ideas for us to get into, start understanding music differently. OK, so this is a video of Paul Beloche. Uh, he demonstrates, um, you know, just one song that can be done in different styles. Okay, and I'll tell you later as to why I chose to decide to play this video. Okay, so here it is. Okay. I hope you all can see. That. Okay. Cool. So here we go. Oh, uh, you're not able to hear? Okay. Um, okay, okay. Well, I'm sorry. Let's see if you can fix that. Okay. Sorry, guys, just bear with me. Um, 
when this issue was happening last time as well. Uh, oh boy. Okay. Can you just give me another minute? Let me see if I can get that video from YouTube. Okay. Um, sorry, guys. I did not expect this. Um, apologies. Um, okay. Let's see if I can uh, find them. Okay. All right. There you go. It's easy to fall into a honesty. Oh, it says in Psalm 33, 3, play skillfully and shout for joy. And these guys are, they sure know how to play skillfully. And that's what this uh, segment is going to be looking at, how we can kind of get out of the rut, kind of expand our style base. And we're going to start by taking a traditional hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. And we're going to start off just very traditional. And then we're going to run it through the grid of various styles and kind of see if we can uh, get a little creative with some of these songs that have become, oh, maybe over-familiar, uh, very too traditional. Let's see if we can kind of breathe some new life into them musically. And then we're going to break each style down and talk about what makes that style what it is. So we're going to talk about reggae and R&B, maybe a samba, maybe country, maybe some Celtic kind of stuff. So um, let's just start off uh, just very traditional. Uh, Jason, you know, I'm sure you've played this before. All hail the power. Just sing it in the key of F. Want to try that, Jason? <laughs> You know, sometimes traditional is the best. Sometimes yeah. you can't really improve upon what is the original. Um, man, that just there's something powerful about that. And as we go through some of these styles, let's keep in mind and ask ourselves, does the style fit the mood of the lyric or the, the meaning of what the song's trying to say? Sometimes we can do more damage than good by trying to get too cute with a classic hymn like that and doing something really funky or something too cute and it and it just kind of loses the whole effect of the song but that was beautiful okay um so why don't we start off with uh running it through uh, just kind of an acoustic guitar approach and uh this is a an arrangement just just being an acoustic guitar player and not being able to play the piano like that. This is one approach that we took recently. So we'll just try thinking like Celtic. And uh, let's just try this together, guys. Three, four. Bring forth the royal diet. 
so let's just kind of break this style down a little bit. I was down here, kind of a, an F5. This is in the key of F, and you can uh, you can look at this chart. We'll put that up on the screen there. You can also download this chart at leadworship.com. So I'm in. I'm doing an F5, no third. It just kind of gives it a real open sound. Okay, so he talks about the style. I mean, this is more for the worship team, uh, you know, for their training and whatnot. So I'm just going to fast forward a little bit and go just for us to see the styles or different styles of music that they play. Okay, um, so let's see if I can find, uh, uh, let's see, uh, find a more fun one. Um, so reggae, yeah, it's okay. Let's see. Of the same song. use this when I've done a chorus many, many times and it's starting to get old and yet it's still a great chorus. I always kind of, that's one of the first filters I put it through is the reggae filter and all of a sudden. Let's stick out another style of the same song. Okay. Oh, that was good fun. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed uh, that section. Uh, right, so uh, that's just, you know, uh, so he had the traditional hymn. Uh, you know, he started off seeing the hymn just traditionally. And then a the couple of styles that was you know, the Celtic style, which is, uh, again, influenced from the UK region, right? Celtic, uh, the music that comes from the UK region, England, Britain, Scotland, Ireland, music that comes from that region is famously popularly known as the Celtic. And then we saw that uh, he also had the reggae style, which comes from uh, you know, the Bahamas, the West Indies Island, you know, the reggae, um, which is, is too good. And then the classic rock, uh, you know, of the same song, Right, I, I wanted to play those videos for just for us to see the impact that the uh, you know the, how the Christian contemporary music has evolved, uh, how it's impacted the the worship music as well. Right, so that was the reason behind it, and also another aspect of looking at it is like uh, let's say you eventually become a senior pastor of a, of your own church, and you want to hire a worship pastor or a, a worship leader of full you know full time, and you want to pay that person. You want to make sure that this person is skilled, that this person understand all these kind of musical languages, so to speak, right? Because 
the worship pastor or the worship leader who's a full-time staff has to train your worship team members as well right so they need to understand the language of music um, uh, in all these different genres that that can be used etc etc so uh, that was another aspect uh, of the reason why i wanted to play these videos as well so yeah i hope that was helpful uh, and fun and uh, okay but so let's take a look at uh, the pros and the cons of Christian contemporary music. Okay, it simply means uh, the positives and the negatives of Christian contemporary music. Okay, so first of all, let's look at the positives. So, contemporary worship never went away. It, you know, it, start, it started in the late '60s, but it still hasn't gone away. It hasn't faded. Right? Every uh, every genre right now is kind of influenced. This is the bedrock, like the foundation for every kind of music that's being played now, right? Uh, so contemporary worship never went away. It stayed strong in the churches that grew out of the Jesus movement. After the revival stopped, after, after the Jesus movement stopped as well, it stayed back in the churches like Calvary Chapel, which is one of the famous churches in the U.S., uh, you know, in a more charismatic groups like the Vineyard, uh, which introduced hundreds of choruses uh, that we still sing today, uh, and songwriters like Rich Mullins. Rich Mullins wrote uh, a song uh, you might know called Awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns, right? He was very influential. So uh, the positive here is that the contemporary Christian music did not really fade away. The sound and the technology might have changed, right? We just have a more expensive uh, guitars, uh, more expensive uh, equipments, ex expensive mics, expensive uh, music boards and whatnot. But uh, all of that has changed. But uh, you know, the contemporary Christian music, the influence of that never really left the church, right? So the fact that contemporary music is, intents and purposes, 40 years old, okay, and in many church, many growing churches, it has been mainstream for the last 20 years, guys. okay? This is very important for us to understand, okay? So when we say 60s and 70s, uh, <laughs> and we can just pause and see it's almost 50 years now. The CCM, the Contemporary Christian Music, has just lasted for 50 or 40 odd years, 50 years almost. And this music, this contemporary music, has been like the main stream, uh, you know, for the growing churches in the last 20 years. The last 20 years is nothing but the 2000s, even 1995 onwards, right? Uh, Larry Norman's Upon This Rock, uh, which helped jumpstart Jesus music, came out 42 years ago. Uh, you know, in the, 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 from the band, the first, second chapter of Axe album, uh, it came out 37 years ago. And some of the albums of Petra also came around 30, 35 years ago. And Petra is another band that's released almost over 30 albums over 30 albums uh, and just to think that it was all released almost 25 years ago 20 years ago 30 35 years ago it's and uh, it's still you know going strong it's just amazing so the positives here is that every church that is being influenced by this contemporary christian music it did not really fade away but it just kept evolving it only kept evolving from the 80s, from Keith Green to the 90s, Michael W. Smith, uh, Hillsong, to the t uh, 2000s where Chris Tomlin and Paul Belosh were becoming famous. And now we have Bethel Music uh, and Elevation. All of them, uh, you know, have that same, uh, you know, contemporary Christian music influence from the 70s. And they're only going. That's the positives. Now, what are the negatives, uh, you know, that that uh, that's happening. That's uh, first thing is Christian awards. Okay, when it comes to Christian awards, um, is that there doesn't seem to be much of the kingdom or countercultural about our way of rewarding. Okay, I'm just reading the text and explain. Rather, it appears 
we pattern our award shows in the same way the world does and applaud the same things that define success in their eyes. What is success in the worldly eyes? The popularity of an artist, worship leader, or, or chart-topping song, and uh, who was able to sell the most albums, singles, etc. right? Now, the whole generation seems to be struggling with compromise and a misguided uh, longing for stage, platform, fame, lights, and human recognition, etc. Uh, the GMA Dove Awards is an example. So in my opinion, worship was never meant to function like an industry. Worship is a priesthood. Okay, uh, that really needs to sink in. That's one of the negatives or impacts of the CCM is that the awards, right? Uh, there's nothing different. If you look at the Dove Awards, for example, everybody celebrated the same as how an Oscar winner or a Grammy Award winner and whatnot. Awards, see, awards in its wrong, right? Awards in itself or rewarding or acknowledging or recognizing someone's effort and work is not wrong. But the fact that we do it the same way as the world is a little surprising it's a little shocking and maybe we could do something about it right uh you know acknowledging that someone has written a beautiful song there's nothing wrong with it at all right but then uh you know somewhere it seems like worship ministry has become an industry and and it's not a priesthood anymore right and we just learned in in the last chapter is like worship and ministry uh is serve is is service isn't it um and that's what the priests did we now uh in second peter peter says and in revelation 1 5 says uh through the blood of jesus he has made us a royal priesthood okay so as priests we are there to serve not really for uh you know to make fame and glory uh and treat worship ministry as in just another industry of the secular world Right? So that's one of the first negative points. And the second negative point is the band mentality. Okay, band mentality. So there are six key distinctions between bands and local church worship ministry. Okay, in short, it's LCWM. So everywhere you see LCWM, it simply stands for local church worship ministries. Okay, so one of the uh, negative impacts of the of the CCM uh, era is it's kind of you know brought in this band mentality into the worship teams of the church. So what is the uh, what are they? Let's look at a few. Okay, the first one is a band is finite. It's a closed circle, but a local church worship team is an open. All right, uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, so because of our exposure to this musical culture, we often assume the following incorrect statements. Okay, First one, our worship team is strongest when it is us four and no more. Because there is chemistry only between us and uh, we can't develop the chemistry with the other people. That's the band mentality, uh, which is not right. The, and second point is the ultimate goal of a worship team is excellence, which can only be achieved by the same group of musicians playing together for a long period of time so that they fully know each other's playing styles and can produce music that is tight. Okay? Once again, talking about chemistry and whatnot. So uh, all of these points uh, are, are uh, incorrect statements. Right, worship team is it's it's not, it, it can't be a closed circle. You can't say it's us four and no more. No worship team. When we look at again the David's worship team from First Chronicles twenty five, it was not a closed circle. Right, it was open for the young and the old, for the teacher and the student. That is the mentality of a worship ministry, which is so different from the band mentality. Right. Um, the second part is. A band is about ownership, but the worship team of a church is about stewardship. Okay, the ownership mentality is concerned with 
it it's my song it's my music uh, you know i wrote it my position my equipment uh, it's just the mini me's you know it's my thing my 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 uh, but you know the ownership says because of my years of faithful service i deserve to play every sunday uh, <laughs> uh, you'll be amazed to see uh, you know uh, such statements and judges but then yeah i have come across those very statements that was uh, you know said towards me is like i deserve to play i don't have to come to practice uh, because i have been you know playing here for 15 years so i deserve to play every sunday even if i don't come for practice uh, you tell me if that's right or wrong <laughs> right but stewardship on the other hand is okay, stewardship Everybody say stewardship with your mics muted. Thank you. I heard you. Okay, so stewardship recognizes that we don't own anything, nor we have any rights to demand. Okay, own anything, we don't have any rights to demand. Uh, you know, uh, Paul just simply puts it, uh, isn't, if I were doing this, of my own free will, then I would deserve payment. But God has chosen me and given me the sacred trust and I have no choice. What then is my pay? It is the satisfaction I get from preaching the good news without expense to anyone, never demanding my rights as a preacher. Uh, he so beautifully puts it. Paul knew that he was crucified with Christ, right? Um, and so we need to steward. We are not here to boss around people and uh, and just you know self exalt. Uh, you know, uh, our, just lift ourselves high. Um, that is the band mentality once again. Okay, so we are looking at the negative impact of the CCM, uh, which is uh, brought in band mentality into the. It can bring band mentality into the worship teams of the local church. Okay, the third point is. The band is an exclusive privileged group, while worship team of the church is about serving. Okay? Band is a privileged group where the worship team is about serving. So, again, our culture tells us that a band is all about elevated platform, the spotlight, the lights, you know, the stage, uh, the big stage, the exclusive backstage area, the green room. Uh, special treatment, uh, you know, everything comes to you, Every, you are being served, uh, all you have to do is sit in the green room and chill on the sofa and just go on the stage uh, when you're ready to go and perform, uh, you know. This, this mindset of band exclusivity can still invade the church. I'm not saying it is in the church, but it can invade. And some churches, you never know, it might be there, right? It will often manifest itself by, for example, a worship team member asking, where is my water bottle? It's supposed to be here. You know, every Sunday at 8 o'clock, you know I come for practice. The water bottle has to be here. You know, such, de such demands uh, shows the band. There is this band mentality in the worship team member. Um, you know, I am a I am a worship team member, not a common church member. That means I will not listen. I will not sit, sit inside the church when the pastor is preaching for the sermon. I am too cool. I'm a worship team member. I play my music. I come lead worship. Then I go outside have breakfast, and uh, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, and whatnot. So Sunday school and weekday ministries and all are not priority. Uh, sorry, brother. You know, I only lead worship on Sundays on the big stage when the light is on and everything. So, uh, you know, I let you go through those uh, notes. Uh, it's very crucial, right? Uh, give your worship team opportunities to serve the church and community without using music. Uh, it's very important. Right? Give your worship team a chance to serve where they don't necessarily have to play music. Let them learn to serve without their instruments and off stage. This helps in building and develops character. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so that's the third point. And a fourth point is a band can be gender, uh, gender based talent-based uh, looks or age prejudice, okay? Uh, that means 
you can be very biased towards only one gender or boy band girl band <laughs> you know spice girls uh, boy zone uh, backstreet boys <laughs> well uh, whereas the local church worship team is open to all once again it's such a beautiful lesson from david's worship team right the young and old teacher and the student um if we were to look at popular secular and christian bands uh see if, if they are an out and out bands christian band it's fine they can be who they are you know like uh, uh, it, it's okay but then what we are trying to address here is that same band mentality can't invade the worship team members uh be the same as the worship team because it's very different worship team is different from a band right uh, i have some of my favorite bands uh, like i said let me reiterate and say this that there's nothing wrong uh, you know in being a christian band right there's uh, one of my favorite all time favorite bands is delirious uh, you know i'm sure you all know delirious okay um, some of the songs that they've written is beyond their time um so it's amazing so there is a place for that and there is a place for the worship team members so the platforms are different that's what we are trying to get at okay uh, if we were to look at a popular secular or christian bands as sources of information on how to create a great worship band for our church we would have to exclude almost all women anyone older than 40 or younger than 20 anyone that is not handsome or beautiful any musician or vocalist that does not have a recording studio voice or talent all of them would uh, you know uh, would not be part of the church worship team um, right so the criteria for selecting a worship team members should be based on are they faithful are they dependable are they humble are they teachable uh, uh, do they have a servant's attitude um, so see the parameters of considering a person into a worship team is completely different from that of a band right and a band has band goals uh we need to sell this many albums by this uh, year and uh you know we need to travel so many countries by this year etc etc and and what not which is all fine for the band right while for the worship team if a worship team member has a different goals from that of the senior pastor then there's going to be a lot of chaos and confusion are you with me right so uh, you may find that as you focus on serving your senior pastor and your church family god may open doors for you to make that recording that you always dreamt of uh, so the goal here of the worship team member should be to serve the vision of the church okay um and finally um we conclude with this point is that a band is about performing while the worship team um of the local church is about facilitating the band sound great versus the presence of the lord was felt today we must increase versus he must increase we must be visible sound gear dress etc versus are people viewing the one on the throne so if uh, if our hearts um I can kind of pause here. Um if our hearts uh you know and our attitude are in check uh you know we can use we can take the good things that the contemporary Christian music uh, the Jesus music movement has had to offer the church and and leave off the band mentality and encourage our worship team members to have the right attitude right heart. um then uh you will have a healthy worship team right and uh and how has this impacted some of the church uh in uh, music scene in india in the modern days is when you look at example uh artists like sheldon bangera uh, who who's taken a lot of the, uh, english uh songs like worship songs and have translated in hindi for example like blessed be your name which was written by matt redman which comes under the banner of ccm um let's be your name uh, even nachunga is undignified the famous english song i will dance i will sing you know um 
uh, he's i think he's also written uh, translated uh, light of the world in hindi so you see how the contemporary christian music of the west has also had its influence uh, on the church in india and how artists of the modern era have been influenced by that uh, why simply because they were being relevant to the generations of this day and age right um so that's that's this whole thing about uh, you know the second chapter guys uh, is one we just look at the history uh, you know uh, where we on which we stand on today and the influence and the impact that it's had on the churches and the worship ministry all over right um, so do you all have any questions uh, or any thoughts that you want to share any questions okay that's one person aaron says no question <laughs> anybody else but what did anything make sense to you today of what we covered uh, Yes, no, maybe. Speak to me, guys. Uh, some of the songs you played in 63's that video, that's uh, blow my mind because I never knew that much old songs because today we are singing that song. I understood how much the impact the worship and uh, songs and music um, on the people's life. Still, that revival carries, and still people love to sing that yeah. song. Uh, that's yeah. amazing to see that. I never knew that much old. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah. Just... yeah. Yeah, thanks, Thomas. Yeah. yeah, heritage is rich. That's beautiful. The foundations that we are standing on, uh, this generation is standing on, is incredible. We are so privileged and blessed. Uh, you know, there's actually a psalm. I forget. Uh, I think Psalm 71 or something. Uh, you know, I will not fade away until I raise my shout of praise until the next generation hears. Uh, you know, it's, it's such a powerful psalm, and uh, that's exactly what some of these people have done. Is um, in their shout of praise. Uh, they've made sure that we hear, uh, you know, their shout of praise and know that who are the, uh, you know, our God is. And uh, and I think that same responsibility falls on us in this day and age that uh, through our shouts of praise, through our songs of worship, through our lives of worship, the next generation will know who our God is. Um, and that's that's wonderful. Yeah, anybody else would like to uh, say anything? Yeah, see, the, Dave, uh, you know, said, yeah, it reminds us of our childhood. Absolutely, yeah. Manu, are you okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Great. I uh, thanks, guys. So we will conclude today. We'll stop here and we'll uh, we'll resume once again, uh, you know, next week with the next chapter. Okay. Uh, thank you all so much for joining in, and I hope you could learn something today. God bless you. Uh, have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful rest of the week. Take care, guys. Stay safe. Bye. Bye.